session eight of the short course, which is chapter eight in the book now. We're through jumbling the order around. Uh, we're measuring distances within the Milky Way galaxy, how we know what some of these things are, that these figures we've been tossing out. I'll cover some early attempts to determine the diameter of the Earth, the distance to the moon and planets, and the scale of the solar system. We'll see how parallax is used to measure the distances to the nearest stars. And finally, we'll look at some ingenious techniques, including spectral class, colors of stars, the motions of binary stars, and the expanding shells of supernovae, among other things, uh, determining the distances within the Milky Way. Let's see if we can get some lights adjusted here. Okay, I think we'll be able to do all right with that. Can you see okay, uh, Freddie, with your equipment there? Okay. So as I <clears throat> hinted in the introduction, we're going to look <coughs> quantitatively at some of the things we just kind of went over in a historical manner last time in the early history of astronomy. <clears throat> Excuse me. How do we measure distances in general? Well, it kind of depends on how long a distance we're talking about. If we have short distances, if you want to measure the width of your front yard, all you need is a big long tape measure and uh, stretch it across the yard and there you have it. But unfortunately, that doesn't work in any astronomical measurements since uh, astronomical distances are kind of by definition astronomical and we don't have any direct methods of measuring almost anything. We use a, a method of triangulation to measure some distances on Earth. That's how surveyors do a lot of their things. If you want to measure the distance across a river, not the Mississippi, or that would be brown. This is a highly stylized river here. Suppose we want to get the width across the river, W. We set up two ends of a baseline one directly across from some kind of marker, maybe a tree or something that we can sight on, and then we pace off or measure off accurately a distance down the river a ways and take a look at it from this position as well. So we have a base of a right triangle. And we sight on that point across the river from those two spots, and we measure the angle. There are all kinds of ways of doing that, but they're built into the base of a surveyor's transit. The tangent of an angle, for those of you who have gotten that far in school, the tangent of an angle is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, or the width of the river divided by the baseline that you've already measured. So if we measure the angle and the baseline, then the only unknown in the equation is the width which we can get from that simple multiplication, and that gives us the distance across the river. That is the basis for an awful lot of astronomical measurements, that simple technique that we just went through there. Any question about that before we proceed? Okay, <coughs> back to some things we did last month. You might remember Aristarchus, who lived several hundred years before the time of Christ. He made the first attempts to make any astronomical measurements. They didn't turn out so hot, but it set the stage for making measurements, and his techniques of calculation were flawless. It's just that his data were rather sloppy because the instruments were pretty much non-existent back then. He tried to set up the scale of the Sun-Earth-Moon system in uh, multiples of the Earth's diameter. He figured that when the moon was at its first quarter phase, a fourth of the way around the Earth and its monthly journey, that it's not quite exactly at right angles to the sun, because unless the sun were an infinite distance away, this angle is going to be a little less than 90 degrees. So he figured if he could measure that angle and catch the moon exactly at first quarter when this is a right angle, then he would be able to calculate the distance to the moon and the size of the moon and the size of the sun, all in terms of the radius of the earth. The problem was that the distance or that angle 
is almost exactly 90 degrees. That's because, you know, this looks like it would be pretty easy to measure, but this drawing is not to scale. The sun is 400 times farther away than the moon, so this is an extremely long, skinny triangle. And this angle actually turns out to be 89 degrees and 52 minutes. So it's so close to 90 degrees that it's not possible to measure back 300 BC with any degree of precision. So, what do you think he did next? Since we can't measure the angle, here's first quarter, here's last quarter, here's back to first quarter again. The times, yes, very good. He decided that he could get the same information by seeing how long it would take to, for the moon to go from first quarter to last quarter, and then comparing that with the time it took to get back to the first quarter Figuring the time would be easier to measure than that angle that was so close to 90 degrees, you couldn't measure it. Well, there's some problems involved here. Who can see some problems with making those timing measurements? They didn't really have accurate stopwatches. They did not have any kind of stopwatches. Yeah. The time was uh, generally measured with water dripping from buckets, the Klepps Hydra mechanism, and that left a lot to be desired. So that was a problem with the measurement technique. What about the moon itself? The orbit is not a perfect circle. It's elliptical, and the moon might take longer to go through one part of its orbit than another uh, just because it's moving faster sometimes than others. But he got around that with patience and persistence. He just measured it over and over and over and over for a good part of his life, and all of the... Uh, inconsistencies in the uh, circularity or ellipticity of the moon's orbit and where it was at different times of the month, all of that eventually averaged out. And he was able to detect a difference of about an hour from the time from the, between the first and last quarter and from the last quarter back to the first quarter. So uh, just about an hour, which is pretty close. The difference is that we know now is an hour, four minutes, and 38 seconds. So using dripping water uh, as his time measurement over a lifetime of observations, uh, that worked out not too bad. Some of his other measurements we won't go into weren't quite that successful, and he eventually came up with this table of values all based on the size of the Earth. The moon was 10 times as far away as the diameter of the Earth. We know now that it's more like 30 and the moon was about a third the size of the Earth when it's more like 0.272. And the sun's distance, we're really getting off here in the sun's distance and diameter. But you notice they're all in the right direction. He's got the moon uh, smaller than the Earth. He's got the sun bigger and farther away than the Earth or the moon. So even though these numbers don't look so hot, they were the uh, even though they're seriously inaccurate, they're probably the first astronomical measurements ever made, and they were in pretty much the right direction. Quite an accomplishment for two or three hundred years before the time of Christ. So those were the very first measurements. Remember Eratosthenes, the one who measured the diameter of the earth. He had noticed that the sun would shine straight down a well at Syene, at Aswan, which is now underwater because of the Aswan Dam. Uh, and at the same time and on the same day, the sun was a little south, 7.2 degrees south of the zenith at Alexandria, which is about 500 miles north of Aswan. And he believed that the earth was spherical and that the sun was so far away that its rays did come in pretty much parallel. Remember, it, uh, even just from the distance for the moon, it's like 89 degrees, 52 minutes. But from as far away as the sun is, the rays are essentially parallel. So here's the diagram for that. Here are the parallel rays coming in from the sun, straight down the well at Syene, but 7.2 degrees off of straight up at Alexandria, 500 miles away. So he set up this little proportion that 7.2 degrees was to the whole circumference of the Earth, 
as 500 miles was to the whole circumference of the Earth. So solving this equation, he came up with the figure of 25,000 miles for the circumference of the Earth, which if you divide that by pi, gives you the diameter of the Earth of 7960 and the accepted value is 7930. Now there's a, there are a lot of assumptions made and we don't know exactly what measurements he used. We think he used a, a unit called the stadium, uh, which was like the length of a stadium in the Greek civilization. We laugh at people today for putting everything in terms of football fields, like how many football fields it is to the Andromeda galaxy or something like that. But Eratosthenes used essentially the same thing, the pacing off the stadia to get the miles between Aswan and uh, Alexandria so as to make his calculation. So, uh, but this was the first highly successful astronomical measurement, the size of our own planet, the Earth. Now, there's nearly always more than one way to interpret the same set of data. Here's another way. Eratosthenes didn't do that, but you could just as well come up with this. The Earth is flat, and when you pace off that distance, the reason the sun was overhead here and not here is because you've walked out from under, and it's back behind you now. So, and you can calculate the same thing, the 7.2 degrees and the 500 miles, that tells you that the sun is 3960 miles away. And there's one more thing you can get by interpreting the data this way, and that is since the sun is a half a degree in the sky, you can calculate the diameter of the sun as well, and it turns out to be 35 miles in diameter. So you actually get more answers this way than you do during it the way we normally do. But also, there's usually only one correct way of interpreting data. But I just thought I'd bring this up to remind you that sometimes people will see the same data and come to different conclusions. and Maybe none of them are right. Sometimes one of them is and the rest of them are wrong. Okay, Ptolemy. We came across him last time as well. Measuring the distance to the moon by parallax. Parallax, as you recall, is the change in apparent position of an object depending on your position or perspective. If you hold your finger close to your nose and alternate looking with one eye and then the other, you'll see your finger jump back and forth. Even though you know your finger is not jumping back and forth, your position of looking has changed. If you move your finger out to arm's length and do the same thing, it seems to move back and forth less because it's farther away. And the farther away something is, the less parallax effect for the same motion that you have. So we just did that. Okay, we can use a big baseline, like a good part of the diameter of the Earth. If we look at the moon against the background of the stars from a point here, and at the same time a point over here, we can set up another right triangle and calculate the distance to the moon. I guess you can see right away a little problem here. Uh, getting somebody to do this on the opposite side of the Earth and figuring out that it was the same time when you didn't have any real clocks or any means of communication. Not only didn't have stopwatches, they didn't have radio either. So, but we don't have to do it that way. We can let the Earth take us around. We can, uh, well, let's see. I'll go through the calculation first here. Uh, 3,000 miles radius and seven-tenths of a degree that the, Earth, uh, that the moon seems to move against the background of the stars when you're 6,000 miles apart. And this uh, calculates out to a distance of 246,000 miles to the moon, which is the accepted value. Here's the alternate way of doing it. You don't really need to do it that way. You just wait on the same night several hours later, and the Earth itself will carry you from here over to here. So you don't have to get an accomplice 6,000 miles away. You can do it yourself later. The problem with that is, what? The moon moves a little bit during that same time. So, but if you keep track of that from your spot, and see how much the moon has moved, you can uh, subtract that uh, effect out and then calculate the true parallax distance to the moon. Any question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Okay, on to skipping over uh, more than a thousand years now uh, to Copernicus in 1543. He published his book, or a friend of his did, Osiander, on Copernicus's deathbed. Of, of, it included, among other things, a scale drawing of the solar system with all of the distances tabulated in terms of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, one astronomical unit. We didn't know what that was for some time later, but it was a scale model. We just didn't know the scale. He did this by measuring the time, sort of like what uh, Aristarchus was trying to do with the moon, uh, measure the amount of time it takes for the, uh, a planet to go from being lined up with the sun to being at right angles to the sun. And figuring that was a fourth of the way around the orbit, he was able to calculate the geometry and come up with the uh, fraction of the orbit that would take place in that length of time and thus the angle with the sun. So just laying out the geometry of it, it was pretty easy to draw the triangles and calculate the distance from the sun to that particular planet compared to the earth as a standard. And this was the set of figures he came up with, and we can see that they're actually fairly close to the modern value. Uh, the earth, of course, is exactly right, because that's by definition. They're both one, no matter what you're gonna do. But you see, Mars was exactly right, Venus was extremely close, as was Mercury, and Jupiter, not bad. Saturn, a <clears throat> little far off, because there just isn't enough data in anybody's lifetime. As long as I, the star geezer in the group, have been around observing the solar system, Saturn hasn't quite made it two times around the sun yet. I haven't seen quite two complete orbits yet. Next year will be, but... Uh, since it takes 29 years, uh, he didn't really have a, a lot of data to work with. So that's a pretty good uh, approximation of the distance of Saturn from the sun based on uh, just barely over one orbital period. Then, last time, we went over <clears throat> the fact that Tycho Brahe set up an observatory with non-optical instruments, because there weren't any, all things made out of metal and wood, to measure the positions of the planets against the stars and gathered huge voluminous quantities of data, which Kepler then assembled into the laws of planetary motion. This is how science works. You get data and then you try to interpret it and set up laws and rules. And then finally, Newton came along and explained Kepler's laws based on Tycho's data in terms of the theory of gravity, which he developed and using calculus, which he also developed to get to the final conclusion. Uh, once his laws of planetary motion were established, then you could calculate the exact distances in the solar system knowing only the distances or the times of their years. Uh, it's a lot easier to measure how long it takes the planet to go around the sun than to measure using triangles and guesstimates how far it is from the sun. But with Kepler's third law, all you have to know is the length of the year, and you quickly calculate the distance from the sun. There's the third law of Kepler, that the year squared is the distance cubed. This is in terms of Earth years and one astronomical unit being the uh, basis for this, the distance of the Earth to the sun. So Mars takes 1.88 Earth years to go around the sun, so just solving this equation for the distance, we find that it's 1.52 astronomical units. You no longer have to measure the distance to Mars. All you have to know is the length of its year, and Kepler's laws allowed us to calculate the distance from that. Quite remarkable. So all you have to do for measuring any planet is to measure the length of its year, and this applies to, you know, we know all the planets, but a comet, or an asteroid, something newly discovered. It works for that too. And with, uh, as we'll see shortly, with uh, Newton's extension of Kepler's laws, we can use this for binary star systems. It works for everything. So um, is that the average distance? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, average distance, the semi-major axis of the ellipse. Now the planets, you know, even though Kepler proved that there were ellipses, if you look at scale drawings of them, you can't tell the difference between a circle. They are very yeah. nearly circular. Uh, 
which is what our theories of the solar system had to explain a couple of months ago. How did they wind up in nearly circular orbits? Uh, now that Pluto doesn't have to be figured into that, uh, it's a whole lot easier to uh, come up with the uh, explanation for the circular orbits on the uh, nebular hypothesis. However, <clears throat> Kepler didn't know about this because he didn't approach it this way. There's an error for the most massive planets, Jupiter and Saturn, because Kepler's equation neglects the mass of the planets orbiting the sun. See, the planets don't really orbit the sun, do they? The planet and the sun both orbit around the common center of mass, which considering that the sun is so incredibly massive compared to a little planet is practically the same thing. But practically and exactly are what makes science so much fun, the difference between them. So there's a, a small percentage difference, less than 1% for Jupiter and Saturn. Just as an aside here, the gas laws, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, if we only knew those measurements to three significant figures, we would have never seen any differences and we'd have never come up with the kinetic theory of gases or intermolecular attractions or molarity uh, or polarity or anything like that. It's all out in the fifth decimal place that all of the good stuff is located. So that's how the breakthroughs are made is by making more and more careful observations and seeing, well, something's off a little bit. We need to figure that out and not just sweep it under the rug. <clears throat> For little planets like Earth, Mars, not necessary. For big ones, it helps a lot. Newton explained he wasn't trying to fool with Kepler's laws anymore. He started over and derived it from fundamental principles and how gravity attracts. And he had previously figured out, remember, that if the inverse square law of gravity applied, then the planet should have elliptical orbits. Well, duh, you know, that's what Kepler had already figured out. And he was just sitting on it till Halley made him publish the results. And that's how we happen to know all of this, was that Halley sponsored Newton and published his results for him. Here's the corrected version. Instead of just p squared equals d cubed, we got the mass of the sun and the mass of the planet in here. And here's the distance of the sun from the common center of gravity, which is not very big. And there's the distance of the planet from the sun, which is the main thing we think about. That's the big distance through the solar system. When the planet is much smaller than the sun, we can drop that term, can't we? The mass of Mars compared to the mass of the sun, that just disappears. And the distance that the sun moves compared to the distance that Mars moves, that can be dropped. And when we do that, we wind up with the exact same thing that Kepler had come up with, the p squared equals d cubed. So Kepler's laws are a special case when we neglect the mass of the planet from Newton's laws of planetary motion. And when we do that, there are no discrepancies anymore. The problem is solved. Here's a new way to measure the scale of the solar system and get the distances. I remember when this first came out. I was uh, a junior in high school when this was done, 1961, the, getting the astronomical unit by radar. If we can bounce a signal off of some other planet and nothing ever comes as close to us as Venus when it's in inferior conjunction or just lined up with the sun. So the, uh, the Earth is one astronomical unit from the sun. Venus is 0.723, so the distance between the Earth and Venus then is 0.277 astronomical units. So using powerful radar, sent a signal to Venus and back, took 276.4 seconds to make the trip. So one way, 138.2, uh, distance equals the rate times the time. Here's the speed of light, and that was the time, so that's the distance, 25.744 million miles between the Earth and Venus at the inferior conjunction. Well, that's uh, only 0.277 astronomical units. Scaling it up to one astronomical unit 92.9 million miles, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And that's 
uh, probably the most accurate way of measuring it. They're, by the time they did that, they already knew it several other ways, but it was nice that this worked out or that would have <laughs> led to an awful lot of papers being torn up and a lot of work started over. So that worked out in 1961. Parallax measurements. This was getting near the end of last time. We saw how the baseline of one side of the earth to the other is not nearly big enough to uh, measure any distance to, to stars. In fact, we have to use the baseline of the diameter of the earth's orbit. 186 million miles across the earth's orbit is the baseline. Even then, the measurements are extremely small and in fact, Aristotle, who kind of liked the idea of the Earth moving around the sun, ruled it out, as you'll recall, because he didn't see the nearby stars moving back and forth any compared to the more distant stars. In other words, there was no observable parallax. Well, that's because even the very nearest stars have a parallax of less than one second of arc, less than a 3600th of a degree. So there's no way in the world they could have seen or measured that back then. So they came to the correct conclusion based on the missing observation that the Earth must not move, so everything's got to go around the Earth. But now we can measure, make measurements of that uh, small kind of uh, angular sizes, so now everything is back to normal. But many pioneer astronomers, all the way up through Tycho, for example, ruled out a moving Earth because you couldn't see any parallax. If you look in chapter 9 of your book, I've got an example completely worked out there. I suggest that you look that over at your earliest convenience, and uh, it's all worked out there. I didn't want to take the time this evening to go through it, but it shouldn't take you very long on page bottom of page 3, top of page 4 in the next chapter of the book. <clears throat> So 186 million miles is our baseline. And we have parallax of the nearer stars against the more distant ones. And using trigonometry, we can calculate the distances to some of the nearer stars. Here's uh, how that works. Here's the sun. Here's the Earth's orbit. One astronomical unit here. Here's a nearer star that when we make that same trip, we see a larger parallax angle. Here's a more distant star, and since it's farther away, the angles are smaller there. So the parallax is inversely proportional to the distance of the star. Usually, we observe from two different points in the Earth's orbit six months apart. For example, January and July. This gives us a baseline uh, physically of two astronomical units, but we calculate the triangle based on one by the definition of parallax, and so that's the angle. Um, <clears throat> the drawing, I have to keep reminding you, is not to scale. This is two astronomical units, or 186 million miles, to the nearest star is 25 trillion miles. So the, the uh, triangle is so long and narrow that this angle is less than one second of arc, less than one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. And that's a big technological accomplishment to be able to do that. Okay, let's just figure out how far a star would have to be in order to have a parallax of one second. Well, we know it has to be closer than Alpha Centauri, right? Because I've already told you that Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to our solar system, is so far away that it doesn't even have a parallax of one second. It's less than one. So a little less than the 4.3 light years. So we know how the answer is going to come out. So we set up the triangle <clears throat> to measure what we refer to as one parsec, a, a distance where the parallax is equal to one second, and that's from the radius of the Earth's orbit, not the total diameter. So here's the trigonometry. Here's one second in here. It's still not to scale, but it's narrower than I have shown it. <laughs> so here's a one second angle. The opposite side is the radius of the Earth's orbit, 93 million miles. And the uh, distance to the star that's one parsec away is unknown. 
we go through the calculations. If you have a calculator or a phone that does calculations with trig functions, you can easily do this calculation and you find out that the distance is 19.2 trillion miles or since we already know that a light year is 5.8 trillion, we can tell that that's 3.261 light years. That's one parsec, an important definition, the distance where the parallax would be equal to one second. Okay, any question about that? Okay. Here's a, another example. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Is it bright because it's inherently bright or is it bright because it's close? Well, it has a total annual parallax of 0.77 second. That's with the 186,000 mile baseline. Uh, based on the radius of 93 million miles, of course, it's half that. What's its distance in light years and in parsecs? Now, the quickest way to do this problem, one step. Does anybody see how to do that? Remember I said the distance is inversely proportional to the parallax. And in fact, one parsec, that distance is for one second. So all we have to do, uh, not even that, not even that. All we have to do is take the reciprocal of the parallax and that gives us a distance in parsecs. Just turn that upside down and it's automatically in parsecs and then we scale it up 3.26 light years per parsec, eight and a half light years. So we see that Sirius is indeed one of the nearer stars. It's also uh, about 20 times as luminous as the sun. So it's bright because it is luminous and because it's close. So this is the calculation the easy way. We can still just use plain brute force trigonometry and calculate the distance to Sirius that way. And it comes out the same way. We get the distance in miles first, convert that to light years, and then to parsecs, just do, doing the same problem backwards. But it works out the same either way. This is in your book, so if you want to look over that in a little slower speed than we're doing now, uh, feel free to do so. But you can use trigonometry or the measurement in parsecs. The reciprocal is the distance. Remember Bessel, great, 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 great grandfather of Johnny Cash. We <laughs> He measured the parallax of 61 Cygni, and you notice this is before photography was in use. So he had to uh, make these measurements with wires in an eyepiece of a telescope against background of distant stars, and it was very painstaking. But within a few percent, he measured the distance to 61 Cygni, which is one of the nearest stars. It isn't the nearest, but uh, it was doable, and he got a, a pretty good uh, uh, estimate of the distance. And that's the beginning of modern astronomy, and that's kind of where we left off last time. Now we can measure up to about 200 light years using the parallax method based on the Earth's orbit. That method can be refined if we uh, send up the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, or since then, the uh, Hipparcos satellite. Hipparchos is a long acronym, but uh, as we'll see next month, Hipparchus was the one who set up the magnitude scale, and the, he actually spelled it that way with a O and uh, Omicron and, uh, at the end. But anyway, uh, we can now measure fairly reliably up to five or 600 light years using a parallax method based on the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Here's some... Uh, little things that we, a little extra thrown in here. Most stars are drifting around in space anyway. They're not in a fixed position in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, if we assume that they are, are drifting around and they have some sort of a common speed, which is kind of risky, then the ones that are nearest would seem to have the biggest proper motions and the ones that are farther away would be almost still. That's how Bessel picked out 61 Cygni because it has a rather large proper motion. If you look at it year after year after year, very, very carefully, it does slowly move across the sky. The brightest star that has a big proper motion is Arcturus. It changes actually quite a bit. Uh, so he selected 61 Cygni to do his measurement on because it 
looked like it was moving a lot, so he figured it was probably pretty close. So the sky, the distance across the sky is called proper motion. These terms are all ancient, and we'd probably do it differently if we were starting over today, but we're kind of stuck with those terms. If we take a series of photographs over a long period of time, that's the best way to measure the proper motion of a star. When I was in graduate school in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny Observatory was there. So were the steel mills. There was no way to see any nebulae or galaxies or anything from Pittsburgh, but they could see, and this is down on the, practically on the Allegheny River, uh, the Allegheny Observatory would, had huge rooms, several of them as big as this room, with shelves all over them like a big library and all full of glass photographic plates that they had taken for more than 100 years when I was there back in the 60s. From the beginning of photography, they've been recording the positions of stars in the sky through their big telescopes. Uh, so they, uh, they were sort of the world headquarters of proper motion back in the 60s. If the motion is along our line of sight, like towards you or away from you, you don't see proper motion, but there's another way to tell whether it's moving or not, and that's with the Doppler effect. Everybody knows the Doppler effect is applied to sound. Suppose you step out in the middle of the interstate and there's this truck barreling towards you and slams on the horn, the pitch of that horn will be higher than it would be if the truck were standing still because the sound waves are bunched together closer and they impact your eardrum more frequently and give you a higher pitch of sound than if it were standing still. After it runs over you and proceeds <laughs> down the highway, if you're still able to hear, you would hear the horn at a much lower pitch because the sound waves are stretched out. I just got tired of using the train analogy for so many years. I thought I'd just <laughs> throw in something different there. The same is true of light. There are characteristic lines in spectra. We'll see more about that later on. But if an object is sitting still, like in the lab laboratory, it's easy to measure exactly where those lines are in the spectrum. If a star, for example, is moving towards you, its spectral lines will be shifted closer together towards the blue end of the spectrum, the blue shifted. If it's moving away from you, the wavelengths will be stretched out and the colors will be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum or red shifted. So that's a quick version of the Doppler effect. We'll get a lot more about that later on in chapter 12 and a little bit tonight. Okay. How do we get the true space velocity of a star? This isn't strictly speaking distance, so this is an extra for the presentation tonight. Here's the true space velocity moving from here to here. First, we split it up into the proper motion. What does it look like from here? It's just moving that many uh, arc seconds per year across the sky. Then we can measure its distance if it's close enough to use the parallax method, we get its distance. Then, putting those two together, we calculate the true velocity across the triangle here. This is how much it's moving in this direction. We still don't know that component, but we know from the angular motion how many miles per second the star is moving straight across our field of view. Then we have to switch to the Doppler effect to get this component. That's the radial component that is on a radius from us. It's moving away from us. Now this is one of the most useful and remarkable and simplest equations in all of science. For those of you who are afraid of equations, this is a good one to get started with because there are only four terms in it and you know what they all mean. This is the velocity, that's the speed of light. So the speed something is moving, as expressed as a fraction of the speed of light, is how much the spectral lines are shifted compared to where they ought to be. So we'll get a, an actual example of that later on this evening. But if that star's light is reddened, the spectral lines are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum by a certain number of nanometers compared to what that same light source would be in a laboratory, 
that fraction is the same as the speed of that star in terms of the speed of light. And if it's towards the red, it's going away from us. If it's towards the blue, it's coming towards us. So truly remarkable, simple, useful equation. So now that we know that component and that component, we can use triangles to calculate this, which is the true space velocity of the star. So that lets us figure out how fast the star is moving and in what direction, just from observations of the uh, transverse or uh, straight across velocity and the radial velocity from the Doppler effect. Moving star clusters. This method isn't done that much anymore, but it was important uh, 100 years ago when we learned a few important things. This was, uh, if a cluster of stars is moving through space, you can kind of assume that they're all moving at the same direction at the same speed. But if it looks like they're getting closer together or farther apart, like they're converging on a spot or diverging, that can mean that they're moving towards us or away from us, and we can get an idea of the speed. Kind of like driving through a snowstorm or a meteor shower, it looks like things are spreading apart if we're running towards them or if we're receding. Nobody ever talks about looking out the back window of your car at a snowstorm, but all the snowflakes seem to be converging behind you just as they seem to be separating as you're running towards them. So that tells us uh, the, the more that effect is there, the closer the star cluster is. If it's only a minor effect, there uh, can be assumed to be farther away. So the Hyades cluster, the distance to that was first determined nearly 100 years ago by that method. You know, the Hyades, the V-shaped group of stars in the face of Taurus the bull, not counting Aldeb Aldebaran, that's a foreground star, but the Hyades cluster was determined that way. And the five middle stars of the Big Dipper, that's a star cluster itself, or part of one, and we've got the distance to them from this method of moving star clusters. Now here's one that we can't go into in any detail tonight because we have to have two more talks first. Next month, Bill has to talk about how we classify stars by spectra and luminosity, and then I have to talk about the life story of stars after that. Once we do that, we can see what this really means, but here's the bottom line version. If you know what color a star is, and that can be measured with the spectral lines in it, you have a pretty good idea of how bright it really is. It's true brightness. And then if you compare that to what it looks like in the sky, and you use the inverse square law of brightness, you figure the farther away it is, the dimmer it looks, the closer it is, the brighter it looks, we can guess very closely how close or far away that star is just from knowing from its color how bright it really is and then comparing that to its brightness in the sky. That will make a lot more sense in a couple of more months, but this is a very useful technique, and we do use that to estimate distances of stars in our galaxy. Okay, here's a confusing term. That method that I just outlined for you is a lot of times referred to as spectroscopic parallax. Now, there's no parallax involved in that, is there? We're not using the baseline of the Earth's orbit to measure an angle and see how far the star is. Why do they call it parallax? Well, it gives us the distance to the star, and so does parallax. So they just, spectroscopic parallax means we're using the spectra of the star to get the distance kind of like you do with parallax. So rather than saying all of that, they call it spectroscopic parallax. Okay, here's one of the most fun and interesting uses of uh, Kepler's third law as modified by Newton. Now instead of the sun and planets, instead of the subscripts S and P, I'm putting in one and two because we're now talking about binary star systems. A lot of stars are binary, where one star orbits around the other. Alpha Centauri is. Uh, in fact, about two-thirds of stars are double or multiple or have planets around them. It's hardly ever any just simple single stars out there. We can measure how long they uh, take to go around each other. Sometimes you can just see it happening, like Sirius, for example. That's close enough where we can see that it takes 50 years for the stars to go around each other. 
Others are so close together we can't see any separation, but we can look at their spectra and as they move towards us and away from us, we can see the lines going back and forth and use that to see what the period of it is. There are lots of ways to skin a cat or to obtain the period of a double star. If we know the distance between them, which in the case of Sirius, we can actually see. Once we know this eight and a half light years away, if we see that it's so many seconds of arc apart in the sky, we can just set up a triangle and see how far apart the stars are. That's D1 plus D2. What amazing thing does that tell us? It tells us the sum of the masses of the stars. It doesn't tell us each one, but it tells us what the masses of the two components of the double star are. If we already know the distance to the star, we can get those true distances in astronomical units and then calculate the sum of the masses, as I've just said. Let's use Sirius as an example. We call it A and B, so now I'm changing the subscripts again to Sirius A and Sirius B. The period is 50 years. The separation between them, you can actually see it, is 20 astronomical units. Okay, substituting into Newton's version of Kepler's third law, what do we have? We have the sum of the masses of the two stars is 3.19 times the mass of the sun. So the two stars put together are 3.19 solar masses. Isn't that remarkable that we can do that? It'd be nice to be able to get the two by themselves, wouldn't it? Since they are orbiting around each other and they do have a proper motion, as they're moving across the sky, one of them moves more than the other, right? The little one does most of the moving, just like Jupiter around the sun. The sun only moves a little. Now, A and B are closer together than that, but one of them leaves a bigger trail than the other one as it moves across the sky, like that. This is the best picture I could find of this. This is awful, but you can see the wiggling of the two components of the star, and the result is if you measure a straight line track across a photographic plate, and see how much the little star, Sirius B, moves compared to the bigger one, Sirius A, it's just over twice as much, 2.4 times. So the distance of B from the center is 2.4 times the distance of A. The, uh, just the opposite of the masses, isn't it? The little one does more moving than the big one. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, it is. Well, dA plus dB is the distance from each other. Yes, yes, yes. dA is the distance from the common center of mass, right. which is the straight line here. The dotted line, the straight line, and then you see the, the wiggly path of the star. Is that how, that's how we get the uh, dA and the dB. It's the, it's the center of, uh, you plot the two orbits and uh, the part that doesn't move, uh, that, that's the straight line around which everything is moving. The little one moves uh, a whole lot around that, the big one only moves a little, but the straight line of the path across the sky would be the, where the common center of mass would be that's moving. Yeah, right, this is observation. Yes, yeah. This is actually a graph, however crude it is. I think it was like eight <coughs> pixels in the whole thing, and when I blew it up, it just kind of disappeared. But that's how we get that the distance uh, of the two, and then the masses are the opposite of the distances. Now we have everything we need, We've got simultaneous equations. We know the sum of the masses is 3.19 solar masses, and we know that the mass of A is 2.04 times B. Stick this in here, solve, and we get that Sirius B is 1.05 solar masses. That white dwarf star is just a shade more massive than our sun, whereas Sirius is 2.14 times as massive as the sun. So now, we, just from looking at the little points of light in the sky and watching them over a period of years, we can tell how far away they are, how far they are separated, and the mass of each one compared to the mass of our sun. 
kind of remarkable, isn't it, that we can even do that. Okay, now we can work that whole problem backwards. Suppose we find another binary star system that's so far away that we can't see the distance in between them. We can use many methods, uh, such as parallax, to see how far away the whole uh, star system is from us. Then we can compute the distance of the system from that, going backward, and from that, we can, whoops, from that we can calculate the, uh, the distance of the entire system from us just by working that problem we went through backwards from the masses to the distances between them to what it looks like to what it looks like in the sky and then uh, setting up the triangle and getting the distance. Okay, here's a kind of an interesting one. We don't get to use this very often, but it's kind of handy. Interstellar absorption. There's a slight amount of gas and dust in interstellar space, and when starlight passes through it, some of the light is absorbed or scattered or otherwise doesn't make it to us. By doing some calculations on stars whose distance is known, we can kind of set up a scale for how much absorption corresponds to how much distance. And so for some star that's too far away to measure uh, its actual distance from us, we can see what the, how much the absorption lines are absorbed compared to each other and use our calibrated scale to calculate how far away it is. Now these are very rough estimates, but sometimes that's all you got. You go with whatever uh, kind of works. So this, this method does give us the, uh, a, a distance when no other method works particularly well. Here's the second to last one, a supernova light shell front. When a star explodes, and we'll go into that uh, in a couple of months, it sends out a shell of light escaping from it. And that shell of light expands at the speed of light. So if you can watch that shell expanding as it goes through the interstellar dust and gas and everything, lights it up as it goes through, Looks just sort of like a fireworks thing expanding as it goes out through the sky. Uh, you can see how many seconds of arc per year it expands, and knowing the true distance equals the rate, the speed of light, times the time, you can see what that seconds of arc corresponds to in true distance. There's your triangle, and you can figure out how far away that star system is by watching that happen. Even more often, and here's the last one, for this evening. This is uh, a remnant, a nova or supernova remnant expansion. Not the light front itself, which expands at the speed of light, but the actual fragment of the blown up star, which expands a lot slower than that. The true rate of expansion is nowhere near the speed of light. It might only be a fraction of a percent. But we can estimate it by looking at the Doppler shift of the material. Not near the edge, because that's moving tangential to us, so it doesn't shift the light, but on the part right aimed at us, we can see that light getting blue shifted and estimate the speed that it's moving towards us and assume it's the same as the speed moving in all directions. There are a lot of assumptions in there, but what else can you do? Here's probably the granddaddy of all supernova remnants, the Crab Nebula in Taurus, M1, that got... Charles Messier making his list of things that weren't comets that we all spend our time looking at. This isn't visible this time of year, but in a couple more months we'll be observing it in Taurus. The star that did it all is that one right there, which as we'll see later on is a pulsar as well. Okay, it was recorded in 1054. It was visible in broad daylight for several weeks, and the Location was carefully marked by Chinese astronomers, so after the invention of the telescope, we could look back there, and there's no doubt that's what it was. Also, if you measure the expansion every year, you can extrapolate that backwards, and it's consistent with 1054 as being the time. So this is the uh, remnant of the supernova of 1054. In 2004, the Crab Nebula was four minutes by six minutes in diameter. Now this isn't seconds, this is fairly large, this is a big thing. So the shell is expanding 
three minutes every 950 years. If we look at the sodium lines in the spectrum, a sodium lamp set up in the laboratory has a line at 589.00 nanometers. If we look right in the middle of the Crab Nebula, the part that's moving towards us, the same sodium line has its wavelength shortened to 586.76. Shortened because the light waves are approaching us. It's blue shifted by 2.24 nanometers. We saw earlier how that equation worked. That shift, 2.24, divided by its laboratory wavelength is about three or four tenths of a percent of the speed of light. So that tells us that it's expanding at a rate of 0.0380 times the speed of light or 707 miles per second. Okay, how, long, how big has it actually gotten in space? How big is this thing? Well, 707 miles every second that's the number of seconds in a year times 950 years times the number of miles in a light year turns out to be 3.60 light years from here to here. So that three seconds translates to uh, 3.60 light years. So we know how big that distance actually is. So we set up a triangle, 3.60 light years, three minutes of arc, I think I've been saying seconds. Three minutes of arc, calculate the distance, and we wind up with a distance to the Crab Nebula of 4,100 some light years. So that's how we know some of these things. You look up in a table of Messier object and see the Crab Nebula is 4,100 light years away. Well, you know good and well we can't do that by parallax. That only works to a couple of hundred light years reliably. This is how we know that. There are a lot of other ways of measuring things, but we can't cover them yet, so that brings us to a conclusion of how we measure distances within the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, do we have any questions on anything we've gone over? Okay, well, thank you for your attention. We will take about a 10-minute break, and we'll come back with all kinds of good things in the second half. So, yeah.